each and every one of you here tonight. I was just going to see if it was possible to get our, our verse back up there, and they're ahead of us. This is great. Uh, we talked this morning about raising the dead, and you might remember our, our centurion scripture of the day, John 5 and verse 21. Now, let's all say this together, if you would. For as God the Father raiseth the dead and giveth them life, even so the Son also giveth life to whom he will. And, and what a wonderful thing it is. We serve the God who gives us life, who can bring us back to life, and praise God that he lays his hands upon us in that way. Uh, tonight, I want to go back to a topic that we were talking about several weeks back, and that was the way that God had laid his hands upon Christ. You, have, you remember in that Old Testament system of sacrifices, how they laid hands of sin upon that animal, how they transferred their sins to that animal. And that was the way in which they were told you can find forgiveness and atonement. But we know as the story of God played out, and as he showed us in the fullness of time, they were always pointing forward, always pointing forward to the only true atonement that we can have in Jesus Christ. And we talked about that. We talked about moving sin from one account to the other account, so to speak. And the whole conversation really gets me thinking, you know, where does sin start in the first place? If so many of these systems were put in place to move sin from one place to the other place, well, where does sin start? And I want us just to always remember what James taught us, James chapter 1, verse 13 through 15. He said, let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. That's not where sin starts. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire, and when desire, and then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. James says sin doesn't come from God. James doesn't even bring up Satan's role in sin. Satan's a tempter, but Satan's not where sin comes from either. Sa James says that it's your desires. It's your desire. When your desires and your will and your wants go this way and the will of God goes this way such that you break step with the will of God, such that a gap opens up in your relationship with God because you go a little bit further from him this way as he's going this way, James says that's where temptation enters the picture. When your desires break step with the will of God, that's where temptation comes from and that's where sin comes from. And he says, you got to deal with it. You, you can't just let it hang around. You got to get it off of your account because sin fully grown will bring forth death. And so we talked last couple of weeks about how the, the blood of bulls and goats, that's how you got it off of your account back then. But again, it was always pointing forward to the, cro to the cross. And man ultimately deals with his sins by giving it to Jesus. And we kind of left it there. And we talked about these things two, three weeks ago. We kind of left it there, but I, I want to take that and pick it up and move forward with it. Well, how do you give your sins to Jesus? That sounds great. I've heard that in church before, but how do I give my sins to Jesus? And I want to start by a couple of places where we might be tempted to put our sins other than Jesus. Historically, uh, humans have put their sins in all the wrong places. And so I want to talk about some places where we're tempted to put our sins and then talk about how we actually do give Jesus our sins and let him deal with those. Genesis chapter 3, the very first sin. If you want to go there with me, Genesis 3 verses 12 through 13. It begins in the garden with that forbidden fruit. And you might recall how Adam and Eve, they didn't put their sins on Jesus, of course. Where did they put their sins? They put their sins on others. That's one of the first places we're tempted to put our sins. We're, we're tempted to put our sins on others. Genesis 3 and verse 12 through 13. The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, why? What is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Where did they try to put their sin? Well, Adam said it belongs on Eve. She gave me the fruit. The sin belongs on her. Eve says, well, the serpent deceived me. The sin belongs on the serpent. And they start playing this blame game. The sin doesn't belong here. It belongs somewhere else with somebody else. King Saul, you might remember, he also played the blame game. 
Uh, you remember in 1 Samuel chapter 15 where Saul is commanded uh, to completely destroy the Malachites, destroy the people, the king, destroy the livestock, the possessions, everything completely destroy this people. God was a gracious God. I don't know if you remember, but way back in the Genesis account, God told Abraham, I'm going to eventually give you this land, but the sin of the Amorites is not yet complete. God never completely judged a people like this until they had turned their back completely. Well, it was time to judge the Malachites. I want you to wipe them off the planet. I want you to take them out. And Saul kind of does it, but not really. Saul leaves the king alive. And as Samuel comes up to confront King Saul about this sin, he hears the sheep, he hears the oxen, and he confronts King Saul with this sin. But what we read in 1 Samuel 15 and 15, what Saul says, Saul said, they, they, not me, not we, not I, they have brought them from the Malachites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we, well now he's talking about me, this is the good part, the part that I'm a part of, we have devoted to destruction. They have done this. The people have committed this sin. Verse 16, Samuel just says, stop, stop. Sometimes you have to do that. Sometimes somebody's just spinning their wheels, talking a lie, and Samuel says, stop. Stop, listen, God has rejected you. God has rejected you from being king over his people. You know, the worst thing about the blame game is it stunts your growth. You can't grow like that. As long as your sin is somebody else's fault, as long as your actions would have been justified if it hadn't have been for somebody else or something else that came in and made you do what you did, but really, your, your heart was in the right place, you were doing the right thing, but somebody else is to blame for your sin, you're never going to grow. We never grow until we take responsibility for what we have done that we need to grow from. And as Samuel is looking at, at Saul's heart, and as, as God is looking at Saul's heart, God says, I can't work with this. God rejects Saul as king. He's never going to grow. He's never going to get any better. That's not the kind of king that I want. We can't play the blame game. But number one, we may be tempted to put our sins on others. We need to take responsibility. It's dishonest. Our sins don't belong on others. And it's destructive to ourselves. Uh, secondly, we, we might be tempted to place our sins under the rug. Let's move from the first sin to the second recorded sin. That is the murder of Abel when Cain kills his brother. Now, Cain didn't place his sin on anybody else, but Cain just tried to scoot his sin under the rug. Uh, we have that great exchange between God and Cain there in Genesis chapter 4. The Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Now, you think I'm dumb, Cain? It's hard to imagine anybody trying to pull a fast one over on God, and yet it's, it's pretty funny. You see it all throughout scripture, don't you? Genesis chapter 18, Sarah laughs at the word of the Lord. She's going to have a son, and Sarah's behind the tent flap, just laughing at what the Lord has said. And he says, why did Sarah laugh? And it's not just that she laughed and, and didn't realize the Lord would see that, but when she's called out, she said, I, I didn't laugh. Well, come on, Sarah, this is the Lord speaking here. The Lord knows. The Lord can see through tent flap, but Sarah lies. Jonah, he gets on that ill-fated ship from Joppa to Tarshish. So I'll just sail out of the jurisdiction of God. I'll get away from God. And he thinks he can pull one over on Yahweh. Or, Yah or, or Gehazi, 2 Kings chapter 5, probably one of my favorites. Gehazi, the servant of Elisha. You remember how Naaman had come and been healed by the prophet? And he's leaving and Gehazi thinks, oh, my master let him off too easily. Let me chase him down and get some of those fine clothing and silver that he brought with him. And he goes and he does take those things from Naaman and he hides them in his own place. And then he comes back to the prophet's house there in 2 Kings 5 and 25. He went in and stood before his master and Elisha said to him, Where have you been, Gehazi? And he said, Your servant went nowhere. He lies to the man that received the double portion of the spirit that had been upon Elijah. The man that enraged the king of Syria by telling the king of Israel everything that the Syrians talked about in their war room. He lies to him and he says, your servant went nowhere. And it's kind of lame, isn't it? 
all of this. It's, it's ridiculous. When people try to pull one over on the creator of the universe, when they think they can accomplish the unthinkable and slip out of the sight of the all-seeing God, well, it's just ridiculous. It's, it's just lame. You know, we might be tempted to scoot our sins under the rug, but it's just ridiculous. We, we might avoid something here on this earth when somebody else doesn't find out about it. We might avoid a consequence or two for the time being. A lot of times, well, that's not even the case. A lot of times we even have to pay for it here. But you know what? Even if we do get by with it here, the only justification that really matters is the one before God there at the final judgment when all things will be exposed, when all things will be brought to the forefront and we will have to deal with every sin. We want to be justified before the all-seeing God. We might be tempted to scoot our sins under the rug, but it just doesn't work. Thirdly, we might be tempted to put our sins on our own shoulders. Now, this is an honest approach. This is a biblical approach, at least with respect to James chapter 1. I need to own up to my sins. My sins belong to me. I'm not going to blame God. I'm not going to blame others. I'm not even going to blame Satan. It was my desires that led to temptation. It's my sin. And you know, that's absolutely necessary that we acknowledge our sinfulness. John says as much in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. He says, if we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Or you might remember the one of which Jesus said, this one went home justified. Luke chapter 18 and verse 13. But the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. We must acknowledge our sinfulness to God, but the error that I would warn against is trying to carry the burden of these sins. Of thinking maybe I'll work it off someday. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 10, for all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. No, you can't work it off. It doesn't work that way. We carry it around feeling the weight of it all the time, the guilt of it. It's just like that albatross. And there are those who believe themselves less valuable, less lovable because of what they've done. You remember Paul said to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 16, from now on we regard no one according to the flesh. We're not going to value people. We're not going to love people according to fleshly terms. We're going to see them through the eyes of our Lord Jesus Christ. From now on, we don't regard people that way. This is the same Jesus Christ that they cursed, they spit, they slapped, and he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Your sin doesn't make you an ounce less lovable or valuable to God. He still loves you. But sin must be dealt with. And so if we can't lay our sins on others, if we can't slip them under the rug, if we can't bury the burden of them ourselves, what, we, what must we do? How do we give our sins to Jesus? I want to talk about three different ways, three different things we must remember in giving our sins to Jesus. And the first being from Romans chapter 5, verse 6 through 8. The first thing that we have to do is an acknowledgement that we must make. The acknowledgement that he has been preparing to receive our sins for a very long time from before the foundation of the world. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 through 8, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The story of Christianity is not the story of our love for him, but it's the story of his love for us. While we were still sinners, while we were still rejecting him, while we were still enemies of the cross, he died for us because he loved us. And the first thing that we must do in giving our sins to Jesus and dealing with our sins is acknowledge the grace of God that preceded us, that was not dependent upon us, that does not exist because of anything that we do. Grace is not earned, grace is accessed. We do not cause grace to flow, we respond to the grace that does flow. We must stand in the flow of that grace that grace, it's, it's just like a shower that's been turned on already. You're not going to get clean if you're not standing in the flow. You have to get in there, but you didn't turn it on. It was on before you got there. That's why John writes in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. The cleansing flow stands for all who would come, and yet we must come. And that brings us to the second thing that we must do. And that is we must access the blood of Jesus if we would deal with our sins. The cleansing is in the blood and to the blood we must go. 
Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. He says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. If you would be washed by the blood of his death in order to live his life, you must meet it in the waters of baptism. It's in baptism that we say goodbye to our old way of living and we take up the new man to live a new kind of life. And that newness of life brings about the third thing that we must do to deal with our sins. In order to deal with our sins, we must live a life led by the commandments of God. We read it there in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 through 6, where he says, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. I want you to notice that John acknowledges the reality of sin. He says, I'm writing this so that you don't sin. But he immediately follows that up by saying, now if anybody does sin, we have an advocate. John recognizes the Holy Spirit. It, it proclaims here that Christians make bad choices from time to time. Christians have weaknesses from time to time. We have lapses of judgment. We fall into temptations, but it never makes it okay. The advocate has paid for the sin with his blood, and we can still maintain a relationship with him by his grace, but the guiding force of our lives must never cease to be his commandments. That's the way that I'm living. He says that you don't even know him if you don't live by the commandments. You've got to walk the same way that he walked. And yes, he will cover your sins, but only, only if you maintain fellowship with him, which comes by his commandments, which comes by knowing him according to his commandments. So let us not lay our sins on others. Let us not push our sins under the rug. Let's not try to carry the burden of our sins ourselves. Give them to Jesus which means we must acknowledge the gracious love, have faith in the saving power of the gracious love of our Savior. Meet him in the waters of baptism and live by his commandments. If any here has any need to deal with sins tonight, that is the way. If you have any sins that are undealt with tonight, won't you come to him in this way? If you're not a Christian, won't you acknowledge the love and have faith in the love of your Lord Savior? which was poured out for you long before you got here, if you've never met him in the waters of baptism, won't you do that tonight? Won't you come to him and allow him to wash every sin clean of your record tonight? If you are a Christian and yet you've not been living by the commandments, you've not been living a life that shows that you know him, if you don't know him, won't you come to know him tonight? If you have anything between you and he, don't leave that way tonight. If there's any need to come, please come while we stand and while we sing.